First, uh, Jonathan Allen, my colleague here, argues there has not been a darker moment for a president or for the presidency since Richard Nixon resigned on the verge of impeachment in 1974. Those are some heavy words. Would you agree? Because last I checked, Richard Nixon wasn't holding a rally on a night like that. And there, President Trump was at a rally with ardent supporters who think that yesterday was nonsense. Well, that's a key difference here, Stephanie, is how the electorate processes all of this news, if they're processing it really at all. I think a lot of people, especially now, have just been so inundated that they can't really differentiate one scandal from another. That said, with the echoes of Watergate here and the unindicted co-conspirator and President Trump's involvement in the accusations that Michael Cohen has made against him, this is going to shift to be the focus going into the midterms. And Republicans are going to be knocked back on their heels and are in even graver danger of losing the House and possibly the Senate, not just because of President Trump President Trump's legal troubles, but I'm hearing a lot of concern that all of the ethical issues clouding congressional Republicans right now, you have two sitting members of Congress, Republicans, who are under indictment. You have this whiff of corruption around the presidency. Democrats are already exploiting this in their television ads. And let's remember the 2006 midterm elections, which washed Republicans out of power in Washington also was about corruption. Everyone attributes it to the Iraq war and voter fatigue over George W. Bush, but you had the Abramoff scandal, you had Scooter Libby, and then you had Mark Foley and the scandal involving the House pages and sexually explicit messages sent. And this just all came crushing down on the Republican Party. And and, and I think that you're looking at, at a situation that is, is, if not as serious, even more serious than that. All right, well then, that's not a whiff, Jeremy, that's a stank. President Trump just tweeted again, I feel very badly for Paul Manafort and his wonderful family. Justice took a 12-year-old tax case, among other things, applied tremendous pressure on him, and unlike Michael Cohen, he refused to break, make up stories in order to get a deal. Such respect for a brave man. What do you think, Brett? Uh, it sounds like the preamble to uh, an eventual pardon for, for Mr. Manafort. Um, look, you know, uh, the president hired as his chief campaign advisor uh, a man who would have been uh, susceptible to Russian blackmail had he, remained, had he not been exposed by the New York Times in uh, July or August of uh, 2016. That's what people ought to understand about the danger that Manafort posed, not that he was just in office or just, just in the campaign for a few months or that these charges go way, go way back. It means that had he remained influential in the, Trump, in, in the Trump campaign, you would have had a man in possibly a high position in the administration who would have been uh, liable to, to a Russian compromise uh, operation. What I find really striking, though, is the, is, is the refusal to come to grips with the really big news of the day, which is what happened with Michael Cohen, because this is not about collusion. This is not about Robert Mueller. This is about the way the president uh, is what seems to be an unindicted co-conspirator in criminal activity, a felonious violation of campaign finance laws that is going to proceed irrespective of whether the president fires Mueller or not, because this is happening in the Southern District. That's really where, where the president's jeopardy lies. Alicia, to Brett's point that this is a preamble for a pardon, that's what Trump wants to do. And Trump is not a Republican. Trump is a Trump. But I want to share how some Republicans have already weighed in, Senators John Cornyn, Lindsey Graham, about the conviction of Paul Manafort and the possibility of a pardon. Would you have a problem if the president were to pardon Manafort? If he was what? Were to pardon Manafort. Um, that's above my pay grade. That's the president's choice. But I think, uh, I think I'd like to see the, uh, the case run its course and uh, let the courts do, uh, do their job. I can't think of what Mr. Manafort's done to deserve a pardon. He hadn't even gone to jail yet. I mean, you have to actually earn a pardon. You have to show that you've learned your lesson. Well, earning a pardon in the eyes of President Trump could be ultimate loyalty. Ben Sass put out a statement. Paul Manafort is a founding member of the D.C. swamp, and Michael Cohen is the Gotham version of the same. Neither one of these felons should have been anywhere near the presidency.
Well, I couldn't agree more. And uh, it may uh, be above Senator Cornyn's uh, pay grade, but it is not going to be above mine if I'm fortunate enough to be the next attorney general of the state of New York. What do you mean? Because the attorney general of the state of New York, that office is second only to Robert Mueller in terms of holding the president of the United States accountable. He resides in New York. The Trump Foundation is based in New York. Most of his assets in New York. And now we know that his criminal associates, of which Michael Cohen is one, uh, also call uh, New York home. And regardless of what the president may do in terms of potentially pardoning, pardoning Manafort or anyone else, as attorney general, I will do my utmost and aggressively investigate and prosecute any person and that he pardons. The president only has the power to pardon for convictions of federal crimes. He has no authority whatsoever to pardon for convictions of state crimes. Now, state law in New York uh, needs to be strengthened, and I implore Governor Cuomo to call the legislature back in right away to, in, to strengthen state law. But right now, the attorney general of the state of New York can prosecute any person that she chooses uh, who has violated state law. It makes it unnecessarily challenging to do so, uh, but it's not impossible. The law should be strengthened. As the next attorney general, I hope on January 1, I without question will hold any person who has violated uh, state law accountable, regardless of whether they've received a pardon from the president of the United States. Oh, heavens. Mr. Cohen, Mr. Manafort, you watching that? What's your take? Well, first of all, I, with all due respect, you missed a step in between Mueller and the state attorney general's office, which is the Southern District of New York. And the Southern District looks like they're probing Trump on many different things. And you can't get him on federal crimes as a state attorney general. But my take is this is a really, really sad situation. For whom? The, for the country. The president of the United States is an unindicted co-conspirator on two counts of conspiracy to commit election fraud. That is a major problem. And the president of the United States last night had his rally. Did you notice how subdued he was? I have never seen Donald Trump at a rally looking so morose. I, I, I he didn't. Was I actually, slurring you, his you, words. You reached out to me last night, and the president may have been subdued, but those people in the audience and people who emphatically just watch Fox News, they're not subdued. They're going to support the president no matter what. Yes, yeah, so that's true. But the president himself, I think he's starting to grapple with what's going on. And he seemed to be down. He knew Michael Cohen, who was on the inside of the inside of his inner circle for years, Indeed. has now flipped on him. And he is not going to be able to deal with this. I think he is going to be backed into a corner. And that's why we're seeing the preamble to the pardon, as Brett talked about. And we're going to see more things that are going to stress him out come in the next month. We've got Bob Woodward's book, Fear. Imagine how he reacts to that. Bob Woodward's credible, unlike Omarosa and Michael Wolff. Then you've got the government shutdown that he's threatening over border security funding. And now Republicans, as an attempt both to deal or to get that funding and to talk about something else with the base, are using the tragedy of Molly Tibbetts and what happened to her being murdered by an illegal an immigrant. Awful, it's awful tragedy. It's absolutely horrific, but Republicans are ignoring what has happened and are not holding him accountable. And I think that's unbelievably sad where, you know, John Cornyn saying it's above his pay grade. No, his pay grade is to be a check and balance on the executive. Okay, but you've been saying that it's sad for a year and a half. Jeremy Peters, um, Evan is saying it's sad. We're talking about political courage from Republicans. You're down there on the Hill. Do you actually think we're going to get any? Because thus far, we haven't. Not yet, no, I mean, absolutely you, you, not. I mean, Steve Bannon no. said this is a moment we all need to check ourselves and get in line, and meaning get in line behind Trump. Right. And, 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 and that's representative of, you know, a hardcore element of the Republican Party here and definitely, you know, a, a large percentage of the members of Congress, to be clear. Uh, but I, I, I do think that if if you're looking just at Michael Cohen, this is not a clean hit. I mean, let's not forget, Michael Cohen is a guy who has repeatedly lied on the president's behalf. He, mm -hmm. has, he has bragged about that. He has said, actually, that he doesn't know of any instances in which the president has ever lied. He is also the person, by the way, who went on television and said that there is no way for you to rape your spouse when there were these uh, questions that uh, Ivana Trump um, raised about an incident uh, in involving her hu husband when they were married. So Michael Cohen is not a credible 
person, and Republicans will do everything they can to remind people of that to discredit him and his allegations. And that's what you're hearing right now, not just from Republican lawmakers, but also in the conservative media that shapes so much of the public opinion. And I think that th this is a case where, for now at least, people do write off m the allegations around Michael Cohen. Now, where that goes from here, what else, as Evan pointed out, uh, that could happen, um, this government shutdown that, that, that we could be fighting over in a few weeks that'll contribute to even more perceptions of chaos, uh, you just don't know where this is going. Yes, and Paul Manafort and conservative media went after Rick Gates as a liar and an Adulterer. But a jury found Paul Manafort guilty on eight charges. I want to bring in the conversation my dear friend Robert Costa, national political reporter for The Washington Post and, of course, moderator for Washington Week on PBS. All right, Bob, you tweeted this morning that you had breakfast with a, quote, veteran Trump player. What are you hearing? And what does that mean? Well, it means that people around the president, or his longtime associates, adv advisors, friends, are, are keeping a close watch on him right now. And one of them told me this morning that they feel this moment, because of how everything happened yesterday, it almost feels like when the special counsel was appointed following the president's firing of Jim Comey in 2017 at the FBI. The president at that point was so taken aback by the quick turn of events uh, that he began to unleash okay, expletives Robert, and fury. Here's mm -hmm. why I don't believe that. Because Friday night, one of president's oldest friends out in the Hamptons, richest guy, one of the richest guys in New York, throws a big old fundraiser for the president. And who are the mm -hmm. attendees? Not President Trump's base, forgotten Americans who finally feel hope. Very smart, successful, well-educated people were there toasting the president and his tax cuts. So here's why I don't believe that. Well, the president, you're getting at an important point, Stephanie, which is the president himself continues to reiterate to his friends that he believes he's successful, that he believes he's under siege, that no one understands his own success. And so he feels the double barrel stories of Manafort and Michael Cohen uh, don't really get at the reality of his presidency. And he's repeating this to friends at fundraisers. He's repeating it to aides on Air Force One as he flies to rallies. But that doesn't mean this isn't still a president who watches cable news constantly and is unhappy with how everything's unfolding. Alicia? Yes, I just wanted to correct something uh, that Evan mentioned. Uh, I did not miss a beat. I've litigated in federal courts across the state from the Western District of New York, including the Southern District of New York. Uh, I did not say I'd be prosecuting for federal crimes. What I said is, as Attorney General, that I have the power on January 1 to prosecute any person, pardon or not, for violations of state law violations of state law. So I didn't want to, I didn't miss a beat, and I just wanted to correct the record for your viewers, well, Stephanie. One thing that's important is that the president can, in extremis, fire Bob Mueller, right? He can end that investigation, but he can't fire he the... Must he must be can't so good at Scrabble, he in can't extremis. <laughs> Felonious, <laughs> extremis. Like he must kill it at Scrabble. I'm, I'm actually good at, I had a feeling. at Scrabble. I'm but uh, look, he can't fire the Southern District. This is why yesterday was so important. I think this was fundamental change in the momentum of of the story, okay? And people understand that paying hush money to a former Playboy, actor, a Playboy model and, and, and porn actress just weeks ahead of, of an election that was decided by 70,000 votes is in fact material and important to them. I would add one more point, which is that someone should remind Lindsey Graham and every other Republican office holder who was in Congress in 1998. Well, Mitch McConnell's in the where, turtle shell right now. Where, it's hard to get to Where him. they stood on impeachment. I supported the impeachment of Bill Clinton in 98 because I think he had disgraced his office and he, and he had committed perjury. I think it is consistent on conservatives and Republicans to support the same for President Trump now, given that the campaign finance violations are much graver, much more felonious. Right, Stephen, take here. my yeah. hand. You're yes. looking for consistency. We're talking about politics. I know, I know. But <laughs> I none mean, nonetheless, Congress has an obligation, and it's why Democrats should be put in office in November. Good luck and to you, brother. Also, He's looking for consistency in recovering politics. There's one more thing playing out, Please. especially in the midterms. You're seeing voters in poll after poll. The majority of the country wants Congress to be a hard check on the president, and in swing districts, only a quarter of those voters want the Congress to be subservient. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.